Welcome to the Tuolumne and Soulsbyville United Methodist Churches. Well, here we are worshiping online still. Oh, it's going to be a while before we add in-person worship. We have our safety protocols ready and approved. Uh, we just need our case rate to go down in the community before we are ready to relaunch again. Let's be in prayer. There, there's so many people, there are more people in the hospital at Sonora Adventist than there have been at any time in the pandemic. So let's be in prayer for, for all of those doctors and nurses, all, all the people who work in the hospital, um, all the patients and their, and their families. And remember Bob Addison, you know, his prayer needs are, are ongoing longer term. Um, and um, also, um, Susan Rundle's brother, Bill Todd, uh, be in prayers for Gary and, and Susan as they continue to be gathered with, with family up in Washington. Um, and, and of course, all, all those people affected by the fires, um, the, the community of Greenville, um, I, I imagine the United Methodist Church there was, was part of what burned down, I, you know, and boy, well, let's continue with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we are so thankful for the day that you have created and shared with us. Lord, you know our hearts, you know all the things that are on our minds, yet yeah, you've heard what we've um, spoken and, and remembered and all the other things. Lord, we give them to you. Lord, because there, there are just so many needs uh, for prayer and for your presence right now. And, and we lift those up just trusting that you're going to be there because we know that you are in our lives. Lord, we, we see your love and grace and mercy in our lives every day and we are so grateful and so thankful and that's that's how we're we're still gathering as as your community even though we're distanced apart from one another we're, we're gathering together and worshiping you and giving you our praise and our thanksgiving and lord we we just continue that in, in this online worship and our, our worship experience together and we just ask that you be present with each household as we are connected together. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, let's just continue with worship.
Good morning, church. Our reading this morning is Psalm 130, which seems very appropriate to the troubles of our times. Uh, those seem to go on indefinitely sometimes. Uh, but this is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be worshipped. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. In the Lord's word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, with the Lord is plenteous redemption. And the Lord will redeem Israel from all iniquities. Hi, church. I hope everybody is having a good Sunday. Um, it's a little smoky here, so I hope that uh, you're not impacted by that. And, and we do want to keep those who are affected by the fires and the smoke uh, in our prayers. <coughs> our uh, scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians 4, 25 through 4. Uh, chapter 5, verse 2. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehoods and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, 
that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be beneficial to those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. May God add this blessing to his word. Amen. you to join in a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, may all of our thoughts and our feelings, the meditations of our minds and of our hearts, and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, you know, our, our clergy, we, we get together still, but on Zoom. And so the last time we, we were talking together, uh, Peggy Bosch, who, who's our, our circuit pastor, who's down in uh, Farmington and Escalon, uh, she shared something that was going on that was exciting in, in the Escalon church. They, they started to wear these bracelets. And on each bracelet, there, there's a bee, and the word kind, and there's either a heart or a cross. It's their response to the overwhelming negativity in our news. And a culture so deeply divided with, with so much hurtful and hateful speech that it's a simple reminder to be kind. 
and the church members in Esquan, well, they're wearing their bracelets, and, and then they're telling their friends and their family why they're wearing their Be Kind bracelets. And then, well, some of their friends and neighbors want them, so they just give them away and get another one. It's exactly, exactly the message we're hearing in our epistle reading. Boy, don't you think the Apostle Paul, he, 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 he would have been thrilled if he would have thought of just a, a simple reminder for, for these new Christians to remember to be kind. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote these letters to believers in Ephesus to teach them that in practical terms, well, how to be the church. But how do you describe something that is brand new, something that's never existed before? The early church was made up of rich and poor, uh, Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free folks, men and women. And they were confronting centuries of prejudice and cultural divisions that make ours look maybe not so bad. And people who were completely divided by ethnicity, race, class, culture, and gender, well, they were all coming to create this never-before-seen movement. And imagine how these new believers felt when they understood Paul's background. You remember back when he was Saul? Before Paul became a, a Jesus follower, he was a member of the prominent Jewish sect, the, the Pharisees. And they separated themselves from, from the people around them in their religious devotion. And Paul's commitment to the Pharisees, it, it was so Great, it drove him to, to persecute those who followed Jesus, even to the point where he participated in the stoning of Stephen. So when Paul speaks about life-changing, radical love of Jesus, people, well, they sit up and listen. And, and Paul is making the point in this passage that their commitment to Jesus doesn't have to set them apart, keep them distanced from, from other people. In fact, he says, Jesus' followers will be known by how well they live in community with others. It's not you and me and forget every, you know, me and Jesus and forget everybody else, no. It, it, this is community. And the way, the way we talk can also, can really reveal how committed we are to being Christian. I, you know, I mean, our actions say a lot too, but in a way, it has nothing to do with an accent or vocabulary or grammar and everything to do with how we use our God-given gift of speech. It is where we are most notably kind. And, and, and you, you know, do our words heal or do our words hurt? Do we work in, in, in service of the truth or falsehood? Do, do our words build up or do words tear down? I, I, you know, and the truth is, besides tearing down, our, our, our hateful words can even incite acts of violence. So, such are the concerns that, that we read about in Ephesians chapters 4 and 5. It, it's a collection of all these miscellaneous ethical advice, and, and many of these instructions, they, they help a congregation understand how to talk. Talk to one another and to others. So let's see what the scripture has to say about the practical ways of being kind. Putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, 
for we are members of one another. Hmm. Well, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? Right? Christians are supposed to speak the truth. Everyone knows, everyone knows that. Uh, and we imagine ourselves as, well, you know, we're, we're, good. We're, we're fundamentally trustworthy people, but maybe, maybe we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. And sometimes we're led to ask the question that uh, Pontius Pilate famously asked. He said, well, hey, what is the truth? What about all those, you know, those infamous little white lies? Oh, you know, we intend to, to not hurt another person's feeling, you know, so you're just a little fib. Uh, what, what about when the dental hygienist asks you, you know, do you, you really brush and, and, and floss all the time? Oh, oh sure. <laughs> what, what about every single expense that you deduct on your, your tax returns. Isn't some of them a bit gray. Telling the truth, well, it isn't always so simple and straightforward, isn't it? Think, think, think about some examples of things that we say that, that quickly let us know, hey, dummy, you haven't been quite so truthful here. Do you, do you hear yourself saying, well, I'm only human. Everybody does it. All I did what I had to do. It's only business. If I didn't do it, well, somebody else would. It's a victimless crime. I was only following orders. Well, you know, nobody's perfect. Uh huh. If you ever find yourself advancing rationalizations such as these, don't you know? You're already in deep water. Speaking the truth, always and everywhere, is one of the most important ways that we talk as Christians. And the only problem is, huh, don't we fail that test almost daily? Isn't it the fastest way that we just get off track and forget to be kind? Hmm. Uh, Ephesians 4 says something else about how to talk as Christians. Let no evil talk come from your mouth, but only what is useful for building up. Hmm. The translation evil as an evil talk is, is actually the cleaned up version compared to the original Greek, the word literally means something like putrid or rotting flesh. What sort of talk is worthy of that kind of a description? Putrid. Well, you, you, you may think the 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 Passages thinking, oh, well, yeah, that's just the swear jar. Uh, that's about obscenities and profanities. But, but if you read on, you'll find the letter writer has something very different in mind. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. Oh, doesn't that make it a lot clearer, huh? It's quite a list. Bitterness is the type of talk that, that keeps calling back to mind the experiences of hurt and pain, which are better off left alone and forgiven and forgotten. It's possible, though, to revel, or should we say grovel, in, in victimhood. And we, we all know injured persons who just can't let it go. Some, some people go to their graves feeling bitter because all oh, they have been done wrong by their parents or their siblings or their kids, their spouses. Oh, they only castigate themselves 
and others just can't let go of missed opportunities, maybe a decade or decades ago in the past. Bitter talk. When it continues for a very long time without any letting up on and on, doesn't it cause some kind of emotional harm to the speaker? It, it, it makes patterns in your brain, not to mention not to mention the misery of all the others who have to listen to the complaints. And next on the list is wrath and anger, words that are pretty much synonymous. And, and you know, didn't we always talk about, already talk about those at the beginning when we were talking about that kind of divisive speech that that's, we're, we're just trying to get a break from and, and why they're wearing those be kind bracelets? Then comes the word wrangling. It, it, it's a creative translation of a Greek word that, that literally means shouting or a raucous outburst. It, if there's a place for anger in Christian life, and, and well, I can get back to it, but surely there is. If anger is about injustice perpetrated upon the weak and the innocent, you got to be angry, but but so much more focused and disciplined in nature. If you're going to accomplish anything in the long haul, you can't just be an angry mob. Next comes the word slander. The the Greek is is blasphema. Whoa! Hey, don't we think we know what that is? It, it, it's the Greek word blasphemy. Usually we think of blasphemy as, as taking the Lord's name in vain, but in the original Greek it means slanderous, gossipy remarks of any kind. Hmm. You probably don't want me going there, do you? A a another Greek word for slander it is diabolos, which it is the root word for the English word diabolical or meaning devilish, and it actually occurs earlier in the passage when it talks about not letting the sun go down on your anger. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, it says, and do not make room for the devil. Literally, do not make room in your heart for slander. You have heard Satan or the devil referred to well as the father of lies. And that's exactly what this word means. To slander another person is to serve a diabolical purpose. You know, don't we still hang on to some of the illustrations from Scottish biblical uh, writer William Barclay? And his description of slander is pure poetry. He said, there are reputations murdered over teacups every day. Gossiping over bone china teacups. Well, isn't that a very British image? But, but you can substitute, well, cardboard coffee cups with Starbucks or whatever label you want to put on it. The tendency is universal. It's a part of us that, that just just loves to pass on that juicy gossip hmm. regardless regardless of whether or not it's true the anticipus of this is found in another list in ephesians be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. It doesn't start with us. Forgiving as God in Christ has forgiven us. Now, now, that is certainly the kind of talk that Christians need to be engaged in. Positive, upbuilding talk in a, is a counterweight to anger and slander and, and all the rest. It's the thou shalt to the that, that 
goes with the thou, thou shall not of the previous verse, kindness, tenderheartedness, literally compassion, forgiveness, building blocks, building blocks of Christian conversation. You know, this is a weakness. It, it, it's not coin niceness. It, it's not being the doormat. Rather, it's filling your mouth with positive, affirming talk. It, it is a strong and a grateful response to the grace and forgiveness that we ourselves have received in Jesus Christ. Sometimes we, you know, we think of Ned Flanders. You, you remember him on The Simpsons? You know, half the power tools in Homer's garage well, they belong to Ned. Homer borrowed them a long time ago. He never returned him, nor does he have any intention of returning them. Some he even scratched out Ned's name and wrote on his own. But still, Homer keeps walking up to the fence and asking Ned, hey, can I borrow your new gadget? And what does Ned unfailingly say? Oakley Doakley, neighbor. Ned is portrayed on The Simpsons as reading the Bible all the time, but very possibly he overlooked Ephesians 4, 26. It said, to be angry, but do not sin. You, you almost think that, that the Bible says, hey, be milk toasts. Don't do anything. And anger equals sin. But it is normal for Christians to get angry. It's a little secret here, just between us. The Bible does consider it normal for Christians to get angry. Nowhere in all the many, many ethical instructions Jesus gives to the disciple do we find that we are commanded to be nice. Did you know that? I, I, I bet you thought that the, the Bible said, be nice. Be a nice guy. In the way that Ned Flanders is unfailingly nice. It's a distortion of the New Testament to equate all anger with sin. Stand up. There's some things we really need to stand up against. There is so much racist and hateful speech right now can't just let it slide. Gotta get angry, but not sin. Stand up, still be kind, offer grace and kindness. Some will say talk is cheap, but not this kind of talk. Kind, compassionate, caring discourse is the rarest commodity in the midst of the fury of soul destroying hate speech. It's all around us. But this is a type of speech that Christ calls us to utter. It's how we talk like a Christian. Isn't, isn't this a time that the world really needs Christians to be kind in our words? And it will change actions. It really will. But it starts. It starts with remembering to be kind. That's it. That's all I want you to remember this week. Be kind. I'm working on it, and I hope you do too.